Hi, I'm Jane McCallion. And I'm Adam Shepherd. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast. This is the second episode of our two-part special on Silicon Valley CEOs. Last week, we talked about some of the positive qualities that have made tech leaders like Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos so successful. But today, we're taking a look at the darker side of the valley. Silicon Valley may have produced many of the innovations that drive the world as we know it, but it's also produced some of the most memorable flameouts, fumbles and falls from grace of the past several decades. Silicon Valley seems to breed as many negative qualities as it does positive ones. And in many cases, they're the same qualities. So, yes, I think when it comes to the stereotype of Silicon Valley CEOs, it's the negative that we all think about, isn't it? Let's be honest here. It's not like kind of why they're such great leaders or whatever. It's the, it's the bad negative kind of urban rumor type stuff, don't you think? Actually, I think it very much depends on who you ask, mm. because a lot of people see Silicon Valley CEOs in particular as this beacon of innovation and forward thinking. You know, look at the you know praise that gets lavished on Elon Musk in particular <laughs> as this visionary leading us towards a better future and. <laughs> While the likes of Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg don't command the same kind of fanatical devotion, mm -hmm. there's a tendency in a lot of people, I think, to look at these individuals as, you know, visionaries, if you like, and inspiring figures. Yeah. And, you know, we did speak about the importance of charisma last week, but charisma... Mm. It's good if you want people to to believe in you and love you and stuff, but it's not good in and of its own right. It's something that, um, you know, kind of psychopaths can exhibit. It's something that uh, notoriously cult leaders can exhibit. Mm. <laughs> and when it comes to certain Silicon Valley CEOs, you do see them held in something approaching cult-like slash you know, kind of deifying status. Mm. It's charisma is much like technology itself. You know, it's a tool and it can be used for either, you know, social good or it can be used to negative purposes. But the cult like mythologizing mm. of Silicon Valley CEOs is something that's encouraged in no small part by the CEOs in question. Yeah. You know, it's, it is a very good way to ensure that your company is in the public focus and is kind of being talked about and is at the forefront of investors' minds, particularly if you're a public company. Mm. Uh, but it's, it kind of fuels this, this mentality of, innovation as an end unto itself mm. you know innovation for many companies is the goal and it kind of doesn't matter what they're innovating yeah they just need to be doing something innovative and that quest for innovation at all costs quite often leads to companies reinventing the wheel i was gonna say so have you heard the saying don't iterate innovate Yes. It's like, well, yeah, sometimes, but like you say, with Will, I don't need to like <laughs> innovate when it comes to something that's basic, something that's working, but can be improved on by making it different sizes um, or more durable or whatever. You don't always have to reinvent things. And you mm. saying that just makes me think of, I think it was Facebook that, ac no, it was Uber that accidentally reinvented the bus. Silicon Valley cannot <laughs> stop inventing buses. There have been, I think, three or four cases where some startup has come up with the bright idea for like a ride sharing service that takes on multiple passengers along a set route. It's like, it's a bus. <laughs> Even better than a bus. Congratulations. But it, it, it happens again and again it, it's like the tech version of uh carsonization yeah exactly it's the tech version of the crab cycle and also so far i love that you knew exactly where i was going with that uh, 
it's yeah it's the tech equivalent of the crab cycle uh which for anyone who isn't aware is the fact that uh there are five separate species who have independently evolved into a crab-like form yeah independent of any other uh influence yeah there are plenty of things that you would look at and go that's a crab it's not a crab. it's not a true not, crab at all it's not a crab yeah and i think that's always going to be a problem you know if you lose sight much as you know mother nature apparently has of you know doing <laughs> it for a reason you know rather than just because or even mm. actually in fairness mother nature it's an evolutionary niche Silicon Valley apparently sees a need for buses and rather than kind of going, we should use these buses that go along these routes. Or even improving buses. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, the the Bay Area has huge problems with pollution, with traffic mm -hmm. congestion, with kind of mobility and transit in general. You know, I don't know if any of our listeners have been on the uh, on the BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit system, which is San Francisco's equivalent of the tube line at any point. But it's about 20, 30 years out of date by this point. It's not a, a particularly modern system. And you do think that with all the with all the innovation power that mm -hmm. is located in the San Francisco Bay Area, surely some of that could be put to modernizing and improving the bay area's respective transport networks but no it's just buses iterating if you will <laughs> yeah exactly iterating and improving but no no mm. <laughs> but bringing it back to to ceos this is this problem of kind of continually reinventing the wheel and creating solutions to problems that don't actually exist is something that I think is a symptom of the the tendency to self mythologize within mm. Silicon Valley. the The entire valley now at this point is in the shadow of figures like Steve Jobs, like Bill Gates, like Mark Zuckerberg, who have built these monolithic companies from nothing and reinvented how we you know, how we look at the world and how we interact with it. And there's this expectation now that founder CEOs in particular, you know, as we covered in last week's episode, founder CEOs in particular have to be reshaping the world in some way. You know, their, their companies have to be fundamentally changing how we live our lives. Yes, it's bigger than the Beatles, if you will. And yeah, it's I mean, that's a lot of pressure as well to put on yourself and to put on all your staff that you're not just creating something useful or you know, a good product. You are like doing something that is world changing or whatever. And yeah, that's a you know, sure great ambition to have. But, you know, your startup of five people in a garage is not necessarily going to go beyond a medium-sized successful business and that's fine not every company needs to change the world i think another problem with this constant focus on innovation and you know reinventing how we do things is that it leads to ceos and leaders sticking with ideas beyond the point of all reason or sense you know, we covered in last week's episode that perseverance in the face of adversity is, in fact, a, a really good quality that Silicon Valley CEOs kind of have to have. But as we touched on in the previous episode, there is a point at which that stops being a laudable quality and instead becomes a CEO just pig-headedly running an idea into the ground. Yeah, when it gets to the point where... You know, all evidence points to the contrary, but they are convinced that no, this is this is the world changing application. Mm. This is the thing which is the future of business, whatever. And this is the way. This is the way, indeed, or perhaps not. Um, <laughs> but you, um, I know what your example you're going to come up with because uh, it's you know my wistful summer romance and your most hated thing, which is Windows Mobile. Windows Mobile. Windows Mobile was a good idea at the time. 
Mm. Uh, arguably, Microsoft got to it a bit too late. Yeah. It could have been really interesting. Should have been really by all rights. It should have been the marriage of the world's kind of still most popular desktop operating system mm-hmm. with a mobile equivalent. But they they just never managed to make it work. The third party support wasn't wasn't there. You know, it wasn't yeah. easy or attractive enough to develop apps for. You know, there are a number of reasons why Windows Mobile wasn't successful. Yeah, the lack of third party res- uh, support is probably was the thing that I found most most frustrating, or like the the lack of apps. Yeah, um, exactly. Drove me around the bend. Mm. But Microsoft kept plugging away at it for years, long past the point when it was obvious to everyone that Windows Mobile was never going to be a thing, ever. Yeah. R.I.P. Rot in hell. (laughs) No! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I think that this kind of doggedness can lead into one of the other kind of notorious bad practices that you find in Silicon Valley, which is ruling with an iron fist, really being Mm. absolutely authoritarian. Your vision is what goes. There is no room for any kind of dissent within the ranks. Um, And if you don't like it, you can leave. Yeah, Um, exactly. Very much my way or the highway. Yeah, yeah. And that's um, probably one of the things that is a character trait, a character flaw in Silicon Valley CEOs. I think that it might be becoming less and less of an issue. I think it is partly because, um, well, partly because in today's business climate, you just can't treat people in the way that (laughs) the the classic examples, you know, Steve Jobs Mm. is the one that gets brought up most frequently in relation to this in terms of you know you did things Steve's way or you just you were you were gone yeah and you know Bill Gates by all accounts was like this to a certain extent although not quite as not not quite as brutally as as Jobs apparently was but you just can't kind of treat people like that particularly with the rise of things like flexible working and I I was going to say, man, this is the US that these companies are in. They can do whatever the hell they like. (laughs) Legally speaking, yes, but the the business climate is less forgiving than than it was at the time. You know, staff are uh, looking more at things like unions, for example. Yeah. You know, staff are organizing more. Uh, Employees are more aware of the the working cultures at other organizations through things like you know Glassdoor and mm-hmm. you know just social media word of mouth yeah they're a lot more aware of like oh you know at other companies I don't have a, a manager who screams at me for 10 minutes if I'm not half an hour early for work every day maybe I'll just go work there that sounds cool yeah um so I, I think there's there's less free reign that CEOs have to to rule dictatorially. Yeah. Uh, but also, I think the the results do kind of speak for themselves. You know, authoritarian rule can get certain results, but it also doesn't breed a as productive a workforce and as happy a workforce and as creative a workforce yeah. as when you kind of are a bit more chilled out. Yeah, and I was going to say, yeah, we spoke um, last week on last week's episode a bit about creativity and the importance of it um, you know, in the context of CEOs. But yeah, it's important. Your team should be able to have time, ability and space, both psychologically and you know, kind of perhaps physically to be creative, to possibly dream up the next big thing and to be able to have the um, courage to come to the leadership, whether that's their manager um, or the CEO directly and say, I've got this idea. And also, you know, it, it can't be pointless to go to your manager to say, I've got this idea, if what they're going to say is lovely, but Steve's not going to like it. Yeah, and I think, you know, linked to this is that CEOs, because of the kind of ridiculous amount of pressure that they're under and the the insanely high drive that they have and the in, the insanely high amount of work that they have to put in 
I think that kind of bleeds over into the idea of saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm working evenings and weekends because, you know, that's the kind of people they are. They, mm. they often can't switch off uh, unless you're Larry Ellison and you go mm. switch off and go to a boat race when you're meant to be taking a keynote. Um, <laughs> they can't switch off so they end up working evenings and weekends and overtimes and you know working on insane crunch schedules they expect everyone else to be able to do the same because you know well if it's you know if i can do it then why can't you kind of attitude crunch being like absolutely one of the worst aspects of not just the valley but kind of the tech industry in general um Mm. software uh producers and games in particular it's just it, it just terrible actually at, mm. you know, kind of just in general i think it's bad um and i think most probably most right-minded people do as well but that well that's you know but yeah like you say they're the kind of people who for them that's fine um and they think it should be fine for everybody else and it, it's not and there's this attitude that silicon valley ceos that this kind of just gives them a free pass to be horrible to uh, employees particularly but just in general mm. really really arrogant i think is yeah like to, to go around being really arrogant uh to you know doesn't matter who and i think possibly eventually one of the things that's happening you know you've spoken a bit about like uh unionizing amongst employees and stuff but the more leaders that you get coming in who are not like that perhaps you know as we alluded to people who are business focused you know they're not founder CEOs, their CEOs who have been brought in later down the line. It's like demonstrable that actually you don't have to be like that to get results. Mm, and sometimes absolutely. it backfire. And if you are just a tormentor to your staff and they get the opportunity to go somewhere else with a nicer leader and a better work culture, they're gonna go. You know, perhaps mm-hmm. a better salary or even on the same salary. Absolutely. You're not gonna stick around. So, Adam, we've looked at uh, all the good attributes of Silicon Valley CEOs, and we've spent the large part of this episode delving into their uh, the darker sides of their personalities and working Mm. practices. So for the benefit of our listeners, what can leaders learn from Silicon Valley CEOs? How you what can they take to make them a better leader themselves? I think one of the most important things that you can take away from Silicon Valley is that for all the, for all the image of the Silicon Valley CEO as, you know, the stereotypical aloof genius who, you know, doesn't have time for showering cough, Steve jobs. uh, And I didn't know that. Did you not? I knew that he, I, I knew he wore like the same outfit every, not literally the same clothes, but I knew that he you know, kind of had his uniform, so he didn't have to. Th- I, th- I think it. I think no. I think it was the same clothes. No, no, he had a uniform, so he didn't have to think about what he was going to wear. So it is like he he had that, but he also he was um, he was a fruitarian, uh, and he mm-hmm. believed that because of that, because he didn't eat meat or anything like that, that he wouldn't have any body odor so he just didn't shower is that true but yeah for for all the the image that individuals like steve jobs cultivate of this kind of reclusive tech genius that kind of doesn't need to bother with social niceties soft skills are actually super important to ceos you know you need to Mm -hmm. be able to interact with not just your staff but with customers partners investors and you know it's helpful if you don't smell while you're doing it (laughs) or shout and scream pout yeah indeed throw your toys out of the pram if someone disagrees with you in a meeting put your sunglasses on while somebody's trying to talk to you (laughs) all this stuff exactly I think from my point of view, um, it's something that I alluded to earlier, which is the importance of encouraging creativity. So, mm. you know, that means giving people, you know, the time and space to do it. Like I said, you know, kind of not 
being so focused on your own vision that you disregard any other opportunity um you know because because that could be your next big thing could be something that you know someone lower down the ranks actually came up with that has to be an important part of it technology is always seen as like kind of there's always this divergence between the humanities and technology and science and that kind of thing step um or there there is seen as there is one uh but that can kind of lead to stem being seen as like kind of very rigid and slightly mm. stuffy and stuff and you know, kind of unless you are storyboarding for a you know video game then you know, you don't really need the creativity side of things or whatever but you do and like all innovation is creativity and there has to be that kind of yeah room to breathe in you know, the tech business as well. And you know, that's just super important in leadership, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And having the the creative thinking, whether it's your own or, you know, somebody that you've brought into the organization, having the creative thinking to identify new opportunities mm -hmm. and to kind of refocus your efforts on that is super important. Yeah, you know, there are multiple instances where organizations have pivoted to something that's now the the main focus of their business and has been hugely successful. Slack, for example, grew out of a web-based online game. You know, they built Slack as an internal messaging tool and looked at it and thought, actually, you know, that's this has got <laughs> yeah, this has got more potential. Yeah. And so yeah, that that creativity is is a key part of it and i think alongside that don't try and rule everything yourself don't try and drive everything yourself you know ceos do not have to be all things to all people mm -hmm. as it were delegate delegate absolutely you know hire good people and listen to them yeah find yourself a sheryl sandberg a steve Ballmer, a tim cook and listen to them give them the authority to to back you up give your team the authority and support that they need in order to take some of your workload off mm. you know you want to be you know as, as much as we've uh bagged on larry ellison for <laughs> blowing off a keynote at oracle open world to go to a boat race that's kind of where you want to be as a ceo yeah. you know you want to have the confidence in your team to be able to go and mess around on boats for <laughs> six months and know that the business is kind of going to go and take care of itself. Yeah, and I think that this is you know, it's advice not just for CEOs in the tech industry, but for CEOs across all industries and indeed just like team managers. Mm. Actually, like, you know, there is something to be learned for, for anybody who manages anybody, I think, from all this. Mm. Well, with that, we're going to have to bring part two of our special double episode on Silicon Valley CEOs to a close. You can find links to everything we've spoken about in the show notes and even more on our website, itpro.co.uk. You can subscribe to the IT Pro podcast wherever you listen to podcasts to never miss an episode. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook, and you can check out our YouTube channel. We'll be back next week with more analysis and insight from the world of IT. But until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro Podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.